Hello and welcome. If you're watching this video, that must mean it's Tuesday and it's time for another session with me, Mr. Fowler, for English 104, Section 3004. I'm so happy that you're able to join me today. We've got a whole host of things to discuss, so I'm going to go ahead and begin. First of all, I'm going to stop my video. I've, you should still hear my voice. Unfortunately, it just seems that in order for these videos to run in the smoothest possible way, um, that the video feed not necessarily be engaged. But that's all right because I'm about to share something with you. All right, so let's go ahead and watch the slideshow. So today, for session 10, we have, like I said, a very specific agenda. Um, we want to, first of all, tabulate the essay results and discuss how to interpret my commentary. Then we need to talk about the three forms of peer review opportunity that we'll be able to engage in. After that, I want to move ahead to the introduction to our novel for this semester, The Princess Bride. And specifically, I want to talk about some of the distinctions between William Goldman and S. Morgenstern. Then I want to go ahead and give you some weekly discussion question work time. Okay, let's start with the essay results. You'll find three kinds of comments on the essays that I return to you vis-a-vis -vis desire to learn. I try to always use your student drop boxes so that you can find the information in the most readily available format. That means if you've already started Desire to Learn up for the day, you should be able to use that man email management system to access all sorts of things from my class and from any other class that you might have this semester. So comment number one, word balloons. In the margins of the drafts that I've returned to you, you should see some detailed textual notes found in the margins of your essays. Sometimes they're more complicated than others, but it's worthwhile in order to understand why the various highlighted uh, materials have been highlighted as they are. Speaking of those highlighted materials, I tend to try to use three distinct different types of uh, color-coded thoughts or commentary points. Yellow highlighted points are suggested changes and spelling correction. Green comments are the ones that are the most important. These are mandated changes, specifically in those uh, reflection to grammar and or mechanics concerns that may be extant in your essay drafts. Lastly, you'll find some blue highlighted thoughts. This is simply a recognition of the presence of an effective thesis statement and nothing more. You'll also find some final or endnote reflection thoughts regarding your essay. This again is a summation of what I've tried to explain as we've continued through the writing process. And you'll also find the essay point rubric as well as a letter grade located in this area. So if you've received an essay that doesn't have any of those materials or is missing some component, then you should contact me as soon as possible after watching this video. Now, for this first assessment, I wasn't quite sure how we should have handled peer review. So I tried to come up with three different ways to approach the process. Now, first of all, you could read my commentary and reflect on my responses during this week's discussion questions. So you don't have to go any further than reviewing the comments I made and then responding to the discussion questions that I provided for this weekly discussion. You can simply say, my peer reviewer felt that 
my thesis statement was clear or precise, or uh, they did have some questions about the ad analysis that I selected. Now to access your feedback in the first place, you'll need to go ahead and visit Desire to Learn. And once you're there, you can select the assignments link, which should open up a version of your essay. And you should see, starting from the left and going to the right, um, different columns. The first one should have assignment submissions, and it should have blue hypertext for your original copy. And then it should have your point value or score. And then it should have something there labeled instructor feedback or just feedback. That section in the third column labeled the feedback should also have a hyperlink available. Clicking on that will allow you to download the version of my essay or rather your essay, but with my commentary. And then there should even be a fourth column beyond that that says due date. So to access that feedback, click the feedback hyperlink to get more information. Now, as an alternative to using only my commentary, if you really want to get invested in a peer review uh, format, you can use the class list link available in Desire to Learn and reach out to a peer review partner of your own choosing. If you want to go this route, I do have a couple of recommendations. Number one, you should reach out to someone that you're familiar and comfortable with. This may be a peer review partner that you've um, had the occasion to uh, team up with in a previous class session, or you may even have just found someone that you've conversed with in the first four weeks of the discussion forum, uh, with, or perhaps you recognize the name of someone with whom you share another class beyond Composition 2. These are all good, reliable sources uh, for people that you may find trustworthy. Now, I know not everyone feels that they um, are bold enough to do this. That's why you have the first option just using my commentary. If you would prefer some kind of anonymous uh, paper to review, reach out to me and let me know. But I'd like you to try to th these first three yeah, unless there's an extant um, issue or an anxiety related issue that you might have. Lastly, this is for the boldest of the bold. You can actually post your essay as a file to this week's discussion forum. This is also the easiest way to do it because once you have posted your essay as a file in the discussion forum, all you have to do is wait for one of your fellow students to read your essay and respond to the weekly discussion questions. In the meantime, you can get busy yourself doing the exact same thing and completing your points for this week. You may, however, want to make sure that you're posting your original text to avoid displaying information that should be kept between you and I that you would wish to remain private, such as your, uh, your numerical score and grade point percentage. So just go ahead and post your original unedited text if you want to use the forum option. Okay, that leads us to a discussion of our novel, the first one that we've had for this semester. So hopefully you found a copy of The Princess Bride by now. I did suggest that you find one by around September 15th which means that by the time of this recording on the 22nd, you should have located a copy. You had ample time to do so. But if you haven't, clearly you should get busy on making sure that that does happen. Okay, so the book itself was written by William Goldman. 
So I want to give you just a brief background on him. Uh, he published his first novel just after college in 1957, and his best works include the novels Soldier in the Rain, published in 1960, The Princess Bride, our text, which was published in 1973, Marathon Man, published a year later, Magic in 1976, and Heat in 1985. Now, he's also quite well known for his work on his screenplays, which accounts for some of the wide variety of uh, projects that he's worked on. Uh, but most importantly, perhaps, he wrote the screenplay for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. This really uh, cemented him as a reliable writer of screenplays in Hollywood. And he began to divide his time between his home in New York and uh, some and many trips out west, as he called it, in the, uh, the film game. He was also credited for the screenplays for the Stepford Wives, All the President's Men, A Bridge Too Far, Misery, the John Grisham uh, film adaptation of The Chamber, The Ghost in the Darkness, and a couple of other screenplays from Stephen King, Hearts in Atlantis, and Dreamcatcher. Now, he and Stephen King actually uh, shared a very good relationship, which is why Stephen King cameos in The Princess Bride during the uh, afterward. So if you have seen any of those movies, um, you will probably have seen the work, or heard the work, rather, of William Goldman. He also published a, a whole host of other novels and nonfiction works um, that you can find more information about, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of his achievements. Now, The Princess Bride was written in, like I said previously, in 1973, and a couple of students actually reached out to me. Uh, I hope they can reflect on this experience as funny rather than frustrating. And some of them were doing their due diligence, trying to find the unabridged version of The Princess Bride. Well, sorry to say, or perhaps you'll be interested to know, that S. Morgenstern, the credited author of the unabridged version, the country of Florin, where the story takes place, William Goldman's son, Jason, and the poolside starlet that he meets in the introduction, Sandy Sterling, are all complete fiction. There is no unabridged version of The Princess Bride. The 1973 copy by William Goldman is the only version that exists. Goldman wrote the book really because his two daughters had asked him for a story. One wanted a story about brides, the other wanted a story about princesses. So he decided he would save his time and write a book that featured both. Now, the entire setup with the introduction and components of the first chapter, which establish a relationship that he had, that William Goldman had with the novel as a young man growing up in outside of New York and with his, sorry, outside of Chicago, and uh, the segments with his son and his wife, Helen, set in New York. That's all a fiction, kind of what's referred to as a meta fiction, which we'll get into in a little bit. So The Princess Bride is basically a romance, but also a satire and an adventure book. So it crosses all of these different types of mediums. So the first thing that you'll notice pretty quickly is that there's a lot of humor, a lot of sort of side humor that goes into the creation of this particular text. So not only do we get tropes based on typical romance and adventures, but we also get a lot of tropes that sort of uh, mock or uh, call out uh, silly things that happen in the process of publishing a book. 
you'll see a lot of side notes, especially in the first chapter, dedicated to uh, moments between uh, Goldman himself as an author and his, you know, ever suffering editor who is trying to make sense of these copious notes that he includes in these long winded uh, par uh, parentheses or parenthetical side notes. This entire prospect is kind of akin to what's referred to as the fourth wall. Now you might be familiar with the fourth wall if you've ever seen films like um, Ferris Bueller's Day Off as a good example, or maybe even Deadpool. But the fourth wall is a development that begins in theater as something referred to as an aside where the theater persona, the acting, the persona, dramatist persona or the actors, they actually get to have what's called an aside where they turn away from the action on stage and directly address the audience around them. One of the most famous versions of this happens in the Shakespeare play, uh, the tragedy of Othello. Now in Othello, it's not the central character that pr uh, creates the asides, but the villain, Iago. And his asides are kind of part of what makes that character, even though he's advocating for a lot of evil things, it makes him more, uh, in some ways, um, comfortable with the audience, or the audience rather becomes more comfortable with him as a narrator, even though his narration is not to be trusted because he's, you know, a, a vile racist and a creep who wants to destroy the life of this heroic figure that we've spent two and a half to three hours with, that being Othello, the central character of the story. But instead of a creepy or annoying narrative narrator that creates these asides, when Goldman breaks the fourth wall, we can trust his authority because he is focused not only on just telling the story of Wesley and Buttercup, but in alluding to the sort of special ness or special quality that results from the power of storytelling itself. And storytelling is such a basic component because there are two actors in the process. There is essentially the teller and then the listener. For William S. Goldman, his role as a listener when his fictional grandfather tells or reads the story of the Prince's Bride to him during a bout of illness. That cements a series of steps that unfold in his mind and essentially change his life. Now that part I believe in. Obviously the Prince's Bride was his own creation, so his grandfather did not read that to him. But you could interpose the princess bride with any number of stories or fairy tales that we've tra all perhaps traditionally been told or exposed to when we're young. The difference between us and William Goldman is that this experience actually sets him off on a specific chain of events. He becomes a much more avid reader, neglecting his former uh, pursuits of baseball and listening to baseball and playing baseball for a life that's more geared toward academics and the letters. He becomes an author later on, and like I said, subsequently a screen writer. And part of the distinctiveness in his writing is that as a screen writer, he's able to maintain a kind of authorial voice in the kinds of films that he participates in. Similarly, his novels, especially the ones that he wrote after 1968, when he 
wrote Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, take on a more filmetic or filmic uh, sort of undertone that makes his writing a lot easier to uh, digest, perhaps, than a typical long-winded novel. I think that's certainly true for our text, The Princess Bride, but I encourage you to reach out and let me know how you feel about that. Um, I find it a really quick and breezy read because of the pacing that uh, he establishes. You may find that your mileage varies for that particular aspect though. Like I said, that may be a, a point worthy of discussion in the next couple of weeks. All right. We're just about uh, finished for today. Now for next time, don't forget that, first of all, final drafts of the essay are not due until October 2nd, which means you have this entire week to revise, to peer review, and to kind of consolidate your thoughts before you present a final version of this ad analysis essay. For Thursday's session, if you have not already done so, please make sure that you read chapters one and two of The Princess Bride so that we can discuss them uh, in the forums next week. And then be sure to reach out to me with any questions and concerns that you might have regarding this week's agenda. Okay, that's all I have for today. I'm so happy that we were able to connect vis-a-vis -vis this video. And I know a couple of you have already contacted me before this video was uploaded regarding questions about this week's discussion questions. So if I haven't gotten to you yet, hopefully you'll see this video, but I'm gonna to try to reach out to as many of you as I can before this video uploads so that you know how to proceed. Well, I'm so happy with the time that we spent together today. It went a lot more quickly than I had anticipated it going, but hey, some days that's just how it goes. I kind of like this note-taking PowerPoint option. Maybe I'll continue to do that in the future. You let me know if you like it or if you prefer or if you, or it's just more of me. Well, in any event, until next time, this is Mr. Fowler signing off and bidding you the best day that you can have. Take care, everyone.